Good afternoon. Uh, I certainly enjoyed the presentations this morning. Uh, I guess this morning, this afternoon for most of you, but here it's just turned noon in, in the Yukon. So uh, it's been a very enjoyable morning for me. And I really want to thank the RAC and as many volunteers for doing such a great job of putting on this conference. Uh, my name is Alan Wooten and my call is VY1KX. Um, I write the QUA column for the uh, Radio Amateurs of Canada, um, the Canadian Amateur, the, the journal. And there I try to present things that I hope will be of interest to amateurs uh, throughout Canada. Um, uh, I live a little bit north of Whitehorse on the North Klondike Highway, so uh, it's uh, really great to be able to talk to you from here. Anyways, I think Paul's going to start my presentations, presentation now, and I hope you find it very interesting. Let's give me one second here. It was my first attempt at a Zoom, so a little bit at the beginning, a few places in between <laughs> may have some problems, but uh, I hope it all turns out okay. Are you getting sound, Paul? See, as the old saying goes, can I be of assistance? How are we doing, Paul? Uh, you're muted. Okay, uh, Alan dropped out and we had to start We're actually running the presentation from my computer. So I am. Did you check the uh, sound? Yeah, I'm going to have a have a look at that here. Yeah. Okay. All right. I've been an amateur since 1964, 56 years. 56 years prior to 1964 would have been 1908, right near the start of radio. What a lot of changes between then and 1964, and what a lot of changes between 1964 and now. In this presentation, I'm going to try to outline some of the changes I've seen from a personal perspective with the hope that it will be of interest to those that have memories of these same times and those whose experiences are more recent. Towards the end, I will present some conclusions I've made based on my experiences and some possible projections. I began in 1964 with a World War II surplus receiver 
and a homemade transmitter. In those days, everyone used separate receivers and transmitters. Before long, I had a Hammerland Super Pro, a large rack mount radio and a separate power supply that I made for it. The transmitter used an 807 tube for the final amplifier. These tubes were surplus too, and I remember they cost 50 cents a piece, far less than the $2 for a 2N107 transistor. I couldn't find my 807, so here's a 6146 uh, for a substitute. Many of you may re remember these times, but for those that don't, on hearing a CQ, making a contact was a slow process by comparison to, to today. First, the transmitter VFO had to be turned on and tuned to the frequency of the received station. Then the antenna was switched from the receiver to the transmitter so that the contact could be initiated. A switch like this might be used for the purpose. Here a Dow key uh, coaxial switch. In the case for both stations, QSOs could involve one frequency for amateur A and a second one for amateur B. Typically, the frequency shown on the dials of both receivers and transmitters was approximate, and the harmonics of 100 kilohertz crystal oscillators were used to determine the major frequency markers, like, for example, 7.0 megahertz, 7.1 megahertz, 7.2 megahertz, and 7.3 megahertz. The, the cr crucial ones, of course, being the first and the last of these. This was better, I think, than using the wave meters required of previous generations of amateurs. So this, uh, the appropriate coil would be plugged into the meter there, and then the dial turned until you got the maximum signal, and then you'd compare the dial calibration with the, with the frequency on the, on the chart on the right. <coughs> In 1964, the examination for a certificate of proficiency in radio were conducted by Department of Transportation Radio Inspectors. For an amateur certificate, the requirement was sending and receiving 10 words per minute with Morse and, written, and a written exam in which the applicant had to draw out the complete circuit diagram of a receiver and transmitter, the latter including AM plate modulation. Successful applicants received a call sign that was assigned sequentially, so that my first call sign, VE7BQO, followed VE7BQN and preceded VE7BQP. After a year of operation as demonstrated by the legally required logbook, an amateur could apply to write the advanced amateur exam, which required 15 words per minute more and more extensive technical knowledge. When you consider that at this time most amateurs were using tube equipment, often homemade, that operated on household power and tube plate voltages of hundreds of volts, the technical requirements of the exams made sense, as did the amateur minimum age requirement of 15 years. I learned a great deal from the equipment of my first station and the guidance provided by some older, <coughs> older amateurs in Vancouver where I grew up. In particular, Hedley Rendell, VE7XW, and Al Erdman, VE7AQW. My antenna stretched from a pole on the back of my house to a tall cedar tree in the front yard of a neighbor across the street. The neighbor was happy to encourage my interest, and no one complained about the wire. I doubt that this would be the case now. After getting my advanced amateur certificate, I was very anxious to try using single sideband and I used some of my paper route money to purchase an ICO 753 kit from which to make a three band transceiver for the 80, 40 and 20 meter bands. I took a lot of care in the construction of both the kit and a power supply built around a TV transformer. This transceiver worked, but had quite disappointing performance. In particular, these transceivers became renowned for their drift and maintaining a QSO with my radio required continual frequency adjustment at either the transmitter or the receiving station. Now, occasionally talk of, now I occasionally talk to someone using a vintage radio that may have some drift and on CW may also have chirp caused by voltage changes at critical transmitter stages, key clicks from rapid rise and fall of the keying and or other problems 
but modern radios have made the tone part of RST almost obsolete and drift virtually non-existent. After a good start in radio, as for many, so many others, work, study, work, and family became my priorities in the next few years, and amateur radio had to take a back seat to them. I maintained my interest in radio, but just didn't have the time or money. There were always more pressing needs. At a time when I could get back to radio, however, I was very fortunate to have a friend, Austin Candy, the E7KX, to provide encouragement. I met Oz, as he was known, because my mom moved into a condominium and he was her next door neighbor. When my mom moved in, he thought his amateur radio days would be over because one end of his antenna was attached to the gable end of my mom's new place. He was very pleased to be informed that her son was also an amateur and that she had no objection at all to his antenna location. Oz had a friend selling a Kenwood TS520S, which I bought and used extensively for many years and still use occasionally now. This radio was a real revelation to me. It was stable, really enjoyable to use, and much easier to use than anything I had experienced previously. With it, I have made many contacts all over the world. I also enjoyed having a Saturday morning CW schedule with it, with Oz for a period of about 15 years. At first, my CW was pretty rusty, awful, according to Oz, but he per persevered, as did I, and I got better and felt a real sense of satisfaction from this mode of operation. It's worth looking at the Kenwood TS520S and a similar radio, the Yesu FT101 series. I don't have an FT101, but here is my TS520S. At the top left, I have a little homemade microcontroller frequency counter that provides a pretty accurate frequency readout. Otherwise, the frequency provided by the analog dial is reasonably close as long as the 25 kilohertz crystal calibrator is used to check the dial every 25 kilohertz. The black box below the frequency counter is a narrow audio filter that can be helpful for CW reception. Split operation with the TS520S is a bit of a challenge and not possible on SSB because without a separate VFO, it requires the use of the receive increment tuning control. For SSB operation, this doesn't provide enough of a frequency split, but CW splits can usually be accommodated. Unfortunately, this means setting the transmit frequency offset on the main dial and using the increment tuning to find the station you wish to contact. Changing the transmit frequency requires that you search again with the increment tuning to find that station. A second VFO is very helpful and was made by Canwood. I also made one with an AD58, sorry, 9850 DDS and was able to get it working successfully with the TS520S. This VFO is somewhat of a pro prototype stage, however, as you can see in the picture. It was a great test project for learning about direct digital synthesis, DDS, and how to pr program a microcontroller to make the DDS work properly. The VFO in the TS520S uses a tuned circuit consisting of an air variable faster and an inductor. It tunes only the 600 kilohertz from 4.9 megahertz to 5.5 megahertz. In operation, the output of a crystal controlled heterodyne oscillator is mixed with the incoming RF signal to produce an output in the range of 8.895 to 8.295 megahertz. This signal in turn is mixed <coughs> with the VFO frequency to give an output at the second IF frequency of 3.395 megahertz. This system is remarkably stable with only very slight drift in the first few minutes after turning on the radio. Coverage is limited by the number of crystals available to the heterodyne oscillator and only the pre-work amateur bands are, are, are covered. Frequency tuning as determined by the VFO tuning rate is very rapid. One turn of the main tuning <clears throat> knob results in a 20 kilohertz change in frequency. 
This is okay on, on sideband, but very rapid for CW. As I mentioned, band coverage is limited to the older 160, 80, 40, 20, 15, and 10 meter bands too. And of course, the tuning of the tube finals must be adjusted for any frequency change larger than about 25 kilohertz. In spite of these and other limitations, and maybe partially because of them, the radio is very enjoyable to use. Friends with whom I keep a schedule tell me the audio sounds great when I use this radio, and the keying waveform looks exactly as it should according to the ARRL handbook. As you can see, it has a very nice rise and fall so as to prevent key clicks. I also think it's worth looking at the interior of this radio. This picture shows the top side, but the bottom view looks just as busy. At the top near the middle is the power transformer for the internal 120 volt AC power supply. The radio could operate on 12 volts DC too, but only with an optional outboard power supply. With that, if the, few, if the tube filaments were turned on, the radio would draw five amps at 12 volts on receive, so the radio would not be a great choice for a portable operation. According to the manual, there are 52 transistors, 19 FETs, 100 diodes, no integrated circuits, and three tubes. One of these tubes, the 12BY7, was visible at center right, the other two still the original S2000, uh, 2100A Japanese equivalents to the 6146 are in the high voltage compartment at top right. Notice the chain drives for the air variable capacitor on, on the right and the hand wired circuit boards. Imagine the cost of building a radio like this today. My main radio now is a Yesu FT1 that I bought from Oz Candy when old age and a, a move pre, uh, prevented his operating. This was the Yesu flagship radio in the early 1980s and seems to be quite rare today. Compared to modern radios, I suspect its electrical performance is limited in a number of ways, but like the TS520S, it is still a very enjoyable radio to use. The key thing I think is phase noise uh, generated from the uh, uh, voltage controlled oscillators. In the few years between the TS520S and the FT1, a number of technical changes were introduced. First, the FT1 has many transistors, FETs and diodes. 214, 35, 40, 344, but also 72 integrated circuits. The LC VFO of the TS520S is gone, replaced with a number of voltage controlled oscillators in phase locked loops that allow general coverage reception. And since it was also marketed to government agencies, the possibility of general coverage transmission too. As has been common for some time, the first IF frequency is well above the receiver's tuning range, in this case 73 megahertz, so as to avoid image frequencies and allow continuous general coverage tuning. A limitation of this practice is, th is that until recently it had been difficult to make narrow roofing filters at low VHF frequencies. Consequently, closely spaced strong signals can cause a degradation of receiver performance. Instead of the elaborate switching mechanism, mechanisms that can be seen in radios like the TS520S, the FT1 uses a 4-bit microcontroller to coordinate much of the complex switching required between VCOs, bandpass filters, and transmit receive. Effectively, two VFOs are provided too, so split operation even over different bands is possible. My FT1 has an inter internal keyer, which was an extra cost option as were several of the available crystal filters, the RAM unit for storing memories of power was disconnected, and an FM unit. A power supply operating from 120 volts AC is included inside the radio. It can also operate on 13.5 volts DC 
and the manual says that a mobile mount is available for underdash mounting. This would not be a good candidate for that use. It is a big and heavy 17 kilogram radio. Probably one of the most obvious changes in the digital readout, sorry, is the digital readout on the FT1. Gone is the analog dial of the TS520S. Frequencies are held in memory too, so switching from one band to another and then back will result in a return to the same frequency. It's also possible to enter frequencies with the numeric keypad that you could see on the right hand side of the radio. Inside, the parts are still of the through hole variety, but the various circuit boards are interconnected by connections along the bottom edge of each board. And the boards plug um, into matching connectors at the bottom of the radio. This construction makes it relatively easy to do work on the radio. It just needs a set of extender boards to lift individual circuit boards out of the radio for troubles troubleshooting. I have a set of homemade extender boards that work fine. This radio came with an operating manual and a technical manual. The technical manual provides very complete information about the radio and includes a section on how to solder and repair circuit boards. Sorry, circuit board traces, not the sort of information provided in the manuals of more recent radios, I think. With the exception of those at the very high end, one of the most obvious changes in newer radios is that they have become much smaller and, than their predecessors, usually operating from a separate 12 volt power supply. As well, they are packed with features, many that were optional extras, even in radios as expensive as the FT1. In many radios, expensive crystal filters have been replaced with digital signal processing that can provide adjustable filter bandwidths from wide to very narrow with very steep selectivity curves. Band coverage has increased too with six meters and for some VHF and UHF at the high frequency end and the channelized 60, millimeter, sorry, 60 meter band in the middle. These many changes have become possible through the miniaturization of components and increased performance of the micro, microcontrollers or microprocessors that coordinate the operation of the parts and the user interface. No more chain drives like in the TS520S. Because of the smaller size of radios and the many features that can be tailored to, this, to the user, most of these are find in, found in menus and front panel controls often have multifunctions of necessity. Some of the newest radios also include very impressive color touch screens that provide spectrum display for both RF and audio and touch controls for the radio's functions. From reviews of radios in general, it seems like the most important received performance parameters of new radios are considerably better than radios of previous generations. And these key parameters like dynamic range, third order intercept and reciprocal mixing at, at even one or two kilohertz separation are very impressive. Transmitter specifications with a few exceptions may not be so good. And a recent comparison that I read uh, between an old Collins tube transmitter and modern radios found the Collins radio about 20 dB better for third order intermodulation product, um, products. Clearly broadband amplifiers operating on 12 volts have come at the price of poor distortion performance. I don't think anybody wants particularly to go back to tube finals, but it, it's interesting to see that difference. Unfortunately, I couldn't find the, the, where I had read that, that particular thing, so I can't give a reference for it, but I'm pretty sure those numbers were the correct numbers. Computer con connectivity is another area in which modern radios differ from their older counterparts. Whereas I can use my FT1 for digital modes, it is not particularly convenient because there is no computer control of frequency. This lack has often given me trouble when I've changed bands during a contest and forgotten to change bands manually on my logging software. This would not happen with a modern radio. Computer connect connectivity 
has also meant that upgrades to our radio's internal software is possible, making changes in some of the radio's features and performance without requiring hardware changes. Of course, at some point, hardware becomes a limitation, and no amount of software tweaks can give an older radio some features or performance of the latest models. Software-defined radios have become common. <clears throat> At one extreme, with, for example, the Flex or Anon radios, the SDR transceiver appeals to those who value their potential for excellent performance and enjoy tinkering with the many settings possible because of the ability to upgrade or modify the software. Radios like the ICOM IC7300 are, I think, of greater appeal to those who value its extremely well-integrated approach. That is, an SDR that doesn't require a separate computer with the complexity and perhaps some of the possibilities that might offer. For some time, many radios have incorporated varying degrees of SDR, and though the high-end radios from Yesu, Kenwood, and Elecraft are superhats, in fact, they include some of the best attributes of both SuperHat and SDR. Considering radios from the, S, the TS520S, an earlier area, era until now, I think radios of the future will keep mixing technological solutions in order to achieve improved performance and less expensive manufacturing. Both manufacturing expense and performance seem to drive the changes we see in the radios themselves. Sometimes the changes that are introduced may also result in a decrease in performance in some area and advantages in others, and it can take a while for the new technological implementations to catch up to some aspect of the performance of an older technology. I think particularly significant is, is, are the small radios. I, I like the fact that there are many small radios with really good performance. When I think of my own experience starting with big and heavy equipment, I realized how important it was to have the support of understanding parents and neighbors and a house with some space in which to set up a station. So many people today have much less space and less understanding neighbors. Nowadays, a station can be small and light in weight and still have the potential to provide much enjoyment even from a small apartment or if necessary, through portable operation. Given that some of these really good small radios can be purchased new for $1,000 or less, the used market for older small radios must be appropriately low too, and offer a route for beginning amateurs to get started. Antennas are another consideration, especially for an HF operator. Sometime within the last few years, there was an article in QST that included a graph that I think went something like the one I've produced here. As with some of the other reference I've given, I, I couldn't find that article. I, I looked very carefully, but couldn't find it. But um, I, I, I reproduced here what, what I think was the general sense of the graph that, that I had seen. And what this graph suggests, to me at least, is that a dipole is a very good antenna and very cost effective. <coughs> a dipole fed with open wire line and balanced feeders and a wide ranging antenna tuner works well as a multi band antenna. A small section of homemade balanced line feeder that uses electric fence insulators as spreaders is shown in the picture but 450 ohm ladder line is commercially available too. I use an antenna of this type myself and find it to be very effective, though in my setup, the adjustments required for band changes may not suit those who want to make, be able to make quick changes. And I, I have to go through a little bit of a routine with my, my antenna tuner to, to do that, but it, it works very well. But what if there isn't enough space for a dipole or there is space, but neighbors may object to the necessary supports. There are a number of possibilities. Because it requires only one support, an end-fed dipole may be one possibility and should be resonant on multiples of its fundamental frequency. Long wires in conjunction with a wide-ranging tuner work too, and with such a tuner also um, are available for multiple bands. 
Some people think some people use antennas stretched out in attic spaces, though care must be used to avoid house wiring and ductwork and to ensure that the resulting RF field does not exceed safety guidelines for the operator and the home's other occupants. Magnetic loop antennas are small and have some very interesting properties. Commercial magnetic loops are available but quite expensive. They can be made homemade, however, and an article entitled Experimental Auto Tuner for Small Magnetic Loop Antennas by Andrew Cornwall, BE1COR, in the May June 2018 issue of TCA, describes his experiences in making an auto tuner for a magnetic loop, and, and it provides a great deal of very helpful information for anyone wanting to experiment with them. Also, I found in searching for the antenna performance art and graph article, I was amazed at the number of antenna articles in QST that, that are found each year there, and how many of them contain suggestions for antennas suitable for restricted spaces or conditions. I think that this point about uh, each antenna is unique because it must fit a specific place and need, so there's lots of room for experimentation and is worth th thinking about too. I think QRP operation, it, it's not for everybody, I, I know, but I think it simplifies everything. The radios can be small, the power supply is small too, and the antennas can be simple and easy to set up. I, I've operated a lot of times with just a wire going out through the door frame, you know, just between the weather stripping and the door and, and uh, you know, with an insulated wire, but it, it can be done with QRP. I'm not sure I'm going to do it with, with a lot more power. Um, the, these radios, QRP radios, can be inexpensive too. Here are three that I have. The first two, an SW20 and a QCX or CW in single band only, but I have found the FD817ND to be a wonderful, rugged and reliable multi-band, multi-mode transceiver. Of course, its cost is considerably more than that for the SW20, which was, I think, about $110 in, in 2000, the year 2000, or the QCX, which I got for $75 delivered to the door uh, a couple of years ago. I've had good QSOs with all three of these radios. <coughs> My first contact with the QCX was with a station in Bulgaria that took place within 20 minutes of finishing the radio's construction. I just had it finished and tuned it up and, and away it went. And anyways, I was very impressed with that. Of course, there are other QRP radios that are available, often in kit form or some like the micro bit that are made but encourage experimentation and modification. And the, the micro bit radios too are both sideband and CW and very reasonably priced. <coughs> There's still a lot of room for home construction too. I was very pleased to get a, um, a homemade radio working and was amazed at how well it performed. This is the, the radio. You can see it's very much in, in a um, prototype stage. But whether it gets completed as the multiband transceiver I originally envisioned is probably not as important as the learning that went along with its construction to this point. As you can see too, the, the radio was made mainly from through hole parts. And, and I'm interested in looking at the numbers of transistors, say in the FT1 and, and the, the um, TS520S that I don't think I'm anywhere near that number and it worked remarkably well. <coughs> While I expect many parts will continue to be available in the through-hole variety, the latest parts are often um, on, come only uh, um, in surface mount configuration. Such parts are very small. Here is a very useful SI5351A frequency synthesizer integrated circuit compared with a nickel. Fortunately, many of the parts that may be of interest to amateurs can be found incorporated into modules. Here are a few examples. So this one, uh, an Adafruit that you can see in, in there um, is the same SI5351 uh, and 
um, it just is all soldered on the board and you just have to connect up to the board. And uh, QRP Labs makes a similar kind of module like that. These modules include circuitry and parts that make the use of the key part much easier than using just the part itself. Some examples are LEDs, switches, voltage regulators, and voltage level shifters, oscillators, and USB connections. The AD9850 DDS module shown comes complete with 125 megahertz oscillator and just needs a programmed microcontroller to turn it into a very useful RF source. All this at about the half the price of an AD9850 integrated circuit by itself. The little chip by itself, I um, was looking to order some. I, I was fortunate to get two samples from analog devices for free, but um, to buy that chip by itself was $27 at the time, and those modules were about $12 or $13. I think that things have never been better for the amateur that is interested in experimentation and home brewing but the skills needed are certainly different from those of the past. One good change is that with modern parts, the high voltages associated with tube equipment are lo no longer an issue. Certainly the high currents required for some equipment require care because short circuits can cause considerable excitement, but the danger of electrocution has diminished considerably. A not so good change is that smaller parts are much harder to see and soldering some parts in place can present a considerable challenge. Once again, the modules mentioned previously may offer solutions, and with care, even small parts can be soldered by using sticky flux to temporarily hold them in place. I find this particular flux works really well. It just, you know, it, it holds the part in and then you put the solder on and, and the solder flows very nicely. Surfboards with small circuit boards, sorry, small circuit boards to which surface mount parts can be soldered to bring out the connections to say, for example, 0 0.1 inch headers can also be very helpful, but it is important to make sure the surfboard matches the form factor of the surface mount part. If they don't, it, I found it is <laughs> impossible to bridge the, the gap. So you have to really check the data sheets carefully to make sure that you're getting the parts you expect with these things. For the future home brewer, I think programming skills will be essential. While an LCVFO is an interesting and challenging project, finding suitable parts for such a project at an affordable price has become an increasingly challenging part of such a project. A VFO can be replaced with a DS, sorry, a DDS module like the AD9850 module or by an SI5351 module but both modules require a microcontroller, an Arduino, or even a Raspberry Pi to provide the instructions necessary for their operation. Now, I'm of the slide rule generation, but although I will never be a good programmer, from books and the internet, and a lot of trial and error, and quite a lot of frustration sometimes, I've learned enough assembly language to be able to use the AD9850 effectively and I hope to be able to do the same with the SI5351 before too long. I've been very impressed too with the willingness of amateurs to help other amateurs through email conversations across the world. Here, for example, is, is a DRA818V VHF transceiver module. That's the silver box in there, being programmed via, via an FTDI USB module. Without the help of a Dutch amateur, the DR, DRA818V would still be sitting unused in the box it came in. He gave me so much help getting the, figuring out how to do the programming of that, and it worked very nicely. Incidentally, the DRA818 also comes in a U version for UHF. And these are relative, you know, really quite inexpensive modules, about well, under $20 kind of thing that can provide a whole new range of experimentation for very little money. They do need a low-pass filter on their output, but you, know, you can do a lot with them. 
Amateur radio is remarkable in providing an opportunity for experimentation and learning. I can't think of many other subjects that can provide such a range of topics that can be studied from low frequencies to microwaves. Amateur radio operators have the tremendous advantage of self-funding their researchers. No one else decides if a project is worth pursuing, so we can enjoy repairing and restoring old equipment, trying out the latest type technology, or doing original research like the work being done by Alex Swartz, Swartz BE7DXW, looking for connections between seismology and propagation. Computers have advanced some of our, sorry, have enhanced some of our activities too, providing new ways to analyze circuits and antennas and new modes of operation. I expect this will continue to be the case. I am very pleased to see the RAC offering amateur, advanced amateur, and CW courses. In particular, I think CW is a mode of great potential benefit to an amateur operator. It greatly uh, increases likelihood of contacts, whether operating at QRP levels or at 100 watts, and gives the satisfaction that comes from learning a new skill. I know that weak signal digital modes are even better at providing contacts, and, and they certainly have their place, but they do so through the mediation of a computer and could, I think, easily be totally automated so that the operator becomes redundant. CW does take effort to learn, but as for many other things in life, enjoyment and a sense of achievement come in proportion to the effort expended. I hope that the present emphasis on numbers of contacts rather than quality starts to change as we move onwards in time. The first transatlantic transmission in 1901 may have been a Morse code S, but surely we can do better now than the very bare minimum that seems so often to be the accepted norm. Of course, in contests and for DX station operating from rare locations, short minimal transmissions are reasonable. But it would be nice to hear more real QSOs where more than a signal report in 73 or TU or something like that are exchanged. I think that radio communication between amateurs has a great deal of potential for good, for increasing the understanding between widely separated people. But to do so, there has to be a willingness to exchange information, listen to the other, and build on the ideas expressed. Through radio, it is also really wonderful to be able to maintain contact with nearby and far-flung friends. I find schedules that I keep with friends are especially meaningful, even though the content of our conversations is often somewhat mundane. You know, just uh, signal reports and weather and things like that. But it, it still gives me a great deal of pleasure, these kinds of contacts. Looking through entries on qrz.com, I find it surprising how many amateurs ask not to receive QSL cards and state they do not send them. At one time, a QSL card was a courtesy, a thank you for a pleasant experience. If QSOs come easily and have little meaning, then it is understandable that QSL cards don't have much value either. Some of my most valued QSL cards are not those from rare en entities, but the ones that have special meaning because they remind me of an especially enjoyable QSO. Some have even come with a letter. I hope that future amateurs have the pleasure of receiving meaningful QSL cards too, like this handmade one I received from a 92-year-old amateur. I think RQSA, sorry, RQSO meant something to him as it did to me. <clears throat> Sometimes I've heard people complain that the examination for an amateur certificate is no longer what it was. That is certainly true, but it doesn't necessarily mean that it is any easier. I am one of the Yukon Amateur Radio Association's examiners, you know, on behalf of the um, uh, Department of Science and uh, whatever the rest of it is. <laughs> but anyways, uh, and before I give an exam, I also try it out myself and I always make some mistakes. 
just as in the past, the exam itself is not as important as what com comes afterwards. This is where mentorship is so very important in providing encouragement and knowledge for more experienced amateurs to newer ones. There's a huge amount to learn in setting up any kind of station, and even a handheld can be intimidating to a newcomer. Little workshops per, for per, prospective amateurs can be very helpful too. And here you can see in this picture of George Privet, VY1 uh, GP, giving assistance and explanations to some prospective amateurs. I've seen comments suggesting that amateur radio doesn't have the same draw it once had for young people as well. I'm not so sure. When I started, there was only one other fellow of about my age in the Vancouver Amateur Radio Club course that I took. You know, this was for you know, the third largest city in Canada then, then and, and here were just two young fellows. I think amateur radio has always been somewhat of a marginal activity. It takes some effort and commitment, and these attributes are not found universally. It would be nice, however, if in the future more women could be encouraged to share an interest in amateur radio. At the moment, it seems to be overwhelmingly dominated by men for reasons I don't understand. I had an interesting experience three years ago when two young fellows and the father of one of them came to see my station. In the expectation that digital communication would be of a special interest to them, I had set up my FT817 for PSK31 operation. To my surprise, the boys were not very interested in the many signals evident on the computer screen. An SSB contact using my FT1 at a station in Japan interested them, but the TS520S sitting nearby was what most caught their imaginations. They wanted to see it in operation and consider it to be a real radio. <laughs> Two further QSOs with Japanese amateurs, one in Russia, and then contacts with VY0RAC and VE6RAC added to their enjoyment. It was some special kind of thing that day, and I can't remember what it was, but it was very nice to get these. Um, the operators at VY0RAC and VE6RAC were especially encouraging to these young fellows, and overall, it turned out to be a very successful event for them. I think it illustrates that we must be careful not to assume what particular things will be of interest to others, and that anything computer-related must automatically be re relevant to young people. Finally, looking into the future, I think that our role in public service is really important. Cell phones, satellite phones, and digital systems have made communications so much easier for the general public and for government agencies that the amateur radio role in emergency communications has changed significantly. But there is often still a need for the broadcasting ability of radio and operators familiar with using it, especially for public events. For example, the Yukon Amateur Radio Association uses its extensive VHF-UHF network to maintain communications for two big events held in the Yukon, where cell phone coverage is minimal and would prove inadequate. I know other amateur organizations provide similar assistance at community events too. This assistance is, I think, a contribution to making a better society and a small return for the many wonderful privileges we hold as amateur radio operators. Thank you for uh, attending my session. I, I hope you found it of interest. So Alan, uh, you have control again there and uh, we're gonna see uh, a uh, series of questions that we might have. Uh, interesting presentation, a lot of changes uh, over the years uh, from, uh, you know, big tube radios down to, you know, micro uh, circuit boards that are on the go now and hotspots, etc. cetera. Uh, and basically, uh, yeah, just run through the questions here. There's, uh, Have you uh, had any experiences with uh, 
RFI in solutions? Uh, a little bit. Yes, I, I find with my computer sometimes, but mostly I, I don't have too much here. I've, uh, I'm very fortunate not having nearby neighbors. I, I have uh, five acres here on the North Klondike Highway, so I don't have the same problem that people say in Illinois have with a small lot or something. Um, and the neighbors are quite a, a long way away. But sometimes I get into my own system with, with RFI. And uh, I'm just going to have a quick look at the chat here. Uh, if anybody has any questions uh, for Alan at the moment, you can put them up on the Q&A. We uh, do have, uh, you know, just a minute or two before we have to flip over to the AGM. Someone asked about the trombone. It, it is a trombone in the background, but it's not me that plays it. It's my, my wife plays the trombone <laughs> in, in the sort of semi-defunct right now because of the, the pandemic in the, the White Horse All City Band. <laughs> anyway. Uh, it's uh, definitely an interesting presentation, Alan. Uh, it's a, a case where, uh, like I say, there's been a lot of changes over the years. And, uh, you know, especially trying to get youth involved in it and, uh, you know, the various uh, methods to, to, of, uh, you know, uh, FT8 and all that uh, right now and the hotspots and a lot of changes to uh, that are coming forward in the industry. And, uh, you know, it, it's going to make the uh, amateur radio uh, hobby uh, certainly uh, not something just you know sitting there and having a QSO with somebody. Yeah, I I know you can see that my emphasis is is on a certain kind of operating too. But one of the things I'm especially excited about is the small radios. I think that that they they just make it so much easier for people to move things around. And you know, as as people move around the country, they could pack things up in a small uh, space and and be able to set up something very easily. So I think that's a real change and a really positive change too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So uh, just before we go to, I'd like to thank uh, RAC once again. I did at the beginning, but I, I found it a very interesting process. And, and, and in preparing this, I found it very interesting too, to think about many of the things that I thought were important. A lot more in 50 minutes turned out not to be long enough for some of the things, but uh, it was certainly a, a good experience having to think through uh, the past and the present and maybe what the future might be like. So one quick question from Doug here. Uh, are, are the components still available to construct an old style tube radio? I think so. I, I was interested in one of the uh, sessions at the, um, you know, there was a a session like this at the beginning of August, I, I can't think of what it was called just at the moment, but one of the people on there had about tube construction. He called it uh, a hollow state construction or something like that. And he was certainly using tubes and, and in very ingenious ways and really excited about the possibilities they offer. So yes, I think they are. He said that tubes are available. I, I haven't sort of pursued that at all because I, I just feel I don't have time to do all the things I'd like to do as it is. So, so I, I just can't see that I will get into that, but I can see lots of people might really enjoy that. And he said there was lots available. Great. Well, uh, it's uh, time is almost up here and we have to flip over to the AGM, but uh, one hand just made a quick comment here. He's been licensed since 1978. And his first rig was a, uh, a TS520. <laughs> but uh, anyway, he says, uh, you know, a lot of people have enjoyed your presentation and uh, appreciate the, you know, there's a lot of work went into it. And uh, we thank you very much, Alan, for your time. And, uh, and we, uh, yeah, I, I would say it's, it's a lot of interesting things that have happened over the years. Oh, yeah. Th thank you for, for watching it, everyone. And, and I, uh, Thanks again. So what we'll do now is we'll let people, uh, we'll end the session here and you can flip over to uh, the AGM uh, portion, which is starting in a few minutes. Thank you very much.
And thank you, Paul. Yep, thanks, Al.